So Genesis chapter 17, I'm going to start reading at verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house, or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house, and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, If I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, while I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah, and said, Quick, three seahs of flying flour, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, 
I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. And that's where we'll stop today. So the overall theme here in this story of Abraham, the whole life of Abraham for that matter, is that God keeps his promises. When God says he's going to do something, he does it. Might be a while, but he will follow through on that. Now the details here in this story are calling attention to us from something that we heard a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Adam and Eve. God's salvation, according to Genesis 3 there, was going to come from the woman's offspring, it said. Literally in Hebrew, the seed of the woman. So it says in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He's talking to the serpent. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this is a promise. It's an ambiguous promise, but there's something here that God is going to do that is going to fix things. So now that we're with Abraham and Sarah, things are going to start getting into gear here. Now, just some context for Abraham and Sarah. This was a long time ago in a place far, far away. The number one priority here for everyone at this time was survival. Death was constantly behind your back trying to get you. And so if you could live a long life and have some children that survived and you could see a generation or two next to you and that your line would continue, that, that was everything you were looking for in life. That was all that you wanted. Because many people, most people probably, didn't even make it to their fifth birthday. And then even after that, there were constantly diseases and famines and wars that were going on. And so you were not looking at a very good odds for surviving. So if you look at marriage contracts back then, everything in the marriage contract was about producing offspring. That was what the purpose of marriage was. Again, survival. People didn't marry for love back then. They married to survive, to continue on. And so to have many children was not only honorable in an honor-shame culture, but it was very useful to survive. So for women back then, barrenness was the greatest curse. You did not want to be barren. If you were barren, that means that you would not survive. And not only that, but you brought shame to your family because you could not help in the survival there. And so Abraham here, being married to Sarah, who was barren at 90 years old and he was 100, Abraham was about to disappear into history. He was not going to survive. And a male heir ensured survival. If you had a male heir, that would really ensure survival. A female female offspring would be good because then she could reproduce, but a male heir could work the fields and fight physically if needed, which wasn't that uncommon. And not only that, but male children could legally inherit property and continue the family that way too. So male heirs were pretty important back then. And this is what is going on. Now God, long ago, had already promised Abraham would have a son, a male heir. And this was a while back already. So in Genesis 15, 2 through 4, Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, 
And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. So there's, this is a long time ago, God is giving him a promise. You're going to have a son, a male heir, like you're hoping for. Now, God was taking a while to fulfill that promise. It was a little while. So, per common practice of the time, Sarah gives her maidservant Hagar to Abraham to bear a child. Now, this would mean that this would be legally, anyways, Sarah's child. Hagar, the maidservant, would be kind of like a surrogate, if you will. But legally, this would be Sarah's child. <clears throat> and ancient legal codes made all kinds of provisions for this kind of thing. This was not uncommon back then. So in the part that we read today, when he says to God, if only Ishmael would live before you, he, Abraham had had Ishmael with Hagar. And Abraham thinks that this child, Ishmael, is going to be God's promise. Abraham thinks, well, you already fulfilled your promise with me. If Ishmael, right? You promised me a male heir, now I have a male heir. So, so we're all set, right? Well, no. Up until this point, God has been promising Abraham would have a son. And in this point, it takes a little different shift. Now, suddenly, God is saying, Sarah is going to have a son. So I want you to, we're going to go through this a little bit. I want you to notice the importance of Sarah here. In verse 15, like Abraham, Sarah has a name change from Sarai to Sarah. So God changes not only Abraham, names from Abram to Abraham, but he changes Sarai to Sarah. Except in this case, there's no explanation, which is a little strange. He explains why Abraham is changed. And Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of many. So there's kind of a substantive change. But with Sarah, Sarai to Sarah, that, it's basically a variation of the same word, which means princess. So it's almost like God is deliberately changing her name on purpose to lay a special claim on her. Not that he's actually changing the substance of her name, but he's just doing it almost just for the sake of changing her name. And when you get to name something, that was significant because a name back then wasn't like the names that we have today. Back then, a name meant something about your identity and something about your destiny. So God is basically saying... I am going to claim Sarah, and I am going to control her destiny. Verse 16, Sarah will bring forth kings and nations. He had said that about Abraham already, but now he's saying it about Sarah. So, Abraham, God said, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, verse 6 there, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. So he's making that promise to Abraham. But once Abraham said, well, we have Ishmael here. We're all set. I have a son. His name is Ishmael. We're all good. No, Sarah is going to bear you a son. And kings of nations are going to come from her. In verse 16, Sarah is blessed twice. Abraham is only blessed once. <clears throat> And then that first part there of verse 16, there's a, in, the, in the Hebrew, there's, there's an emphasis on her. I will bless her. We're, t we're talking her here. It's not just you having a male heir. We're t I'm, I'm going to bless her. And then he repeats it again. I will bless her. So twice God says of Sarah, I will bless her. That's significant. And then in verse 19 and 21, God is insistent that his promised child is by Sarah. Let's just read those again. Verse 19, God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name 
Isaac. And then 21. I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. That, it was a little redundant to say, whom Sarah shall bear you there in 21. But God adds that for emphasis. Sarah is going to bear you a son. In verse 9 of chapter 18 there. The visitors, they come and Abraham sees them and he is very hospitable to them and, and they're eating. And then the visitors, their first order of business is, where is Sarah? That's, their, that's the first thing that they bring up. So far it's been, yeah, sure, you can prepare us a meal. That'd be, that'd be really nice, sure. But the first thing they bring up is, where's Sarah? And then verse 10, again. Let's look at that. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Again, some emphasis there. And it looks like Abraham didn't tell Sarah about what God said to him before. Because it's like she's hearing this for the first time and she's laughing about it. Like, what? Really? So Abraham kind of, apparently kind of kept that to himself. He didn't go home right away and say, well, guess what, honey? God said that you are going to have a child, even, even though we're at the age that we are. He just kind of left that. God, just a, just a little thought for you here. God's salvation comes by His initiative and not ours. This is God starting His plan of salvation where He's going to start a covenant that is going to lead to Christ, that's going to bless all the world. And this is starting on His initiative. And God's salvation is from, as Galatians says, it comes from freedom, not from slavery. God is a God of freedom and not of slavery. And so His covenant comes from the free woman and not from a slave woman. So, this is where God's covenant of salvation really starts now. The promise He made to Adam and Eve is going to start getting into gear right now. God's salvation plan begins and ends with the woman's offspring in an impossible conception. It starts this way with Abraham and Sarah, and it's going to end that way when Mary conceives Jesus. So Isaac was born to a 90-year-old barren woman. Jesus was born to a young woman who had never been with a man. There's a pattern here. We're meant to notice this and call that as a connection. And if you look at the actual verses between Mary and Sarah, there's some similarities there. It says in Genesis 21, The Lord visited Sarah as He had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as He had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son. Abraham's not mentioned right there. Now we know it's Abraham's son because God had promised him, you know, the son from your own body is going to be your heir. But the way it's worded there, it's kind of, kind of similar to the way it's worded down here. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The man is not mentioned there. There's no man. It's the the offspring of a woman that is going to be the salvation of humanity. So this is quite a far-fetched thing. How many 90-year-old women and 100-year-old men have children? So this is not... They, you don't need to know a lot about how reproduction works to, to know that that is pretty far-fetched. They even knew about this back then. So Abraham and Sarah both laugh in disbelief. Both of them laugh. Not just one, both of them. And God kind of rebukes both of them for laughing. Sarah is called out on it. Why did you laugh? 
And some people think that Abraham isn't rebuked, but I really think he is. So if you look at verse 17, it says, particularly in Hebrew, it doesn't come out in English very well, Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. Then in verse 19, this is God's response after Abraham laughed. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name, he laughed. So God is basically calling Abraham on what he has done. You think that's funny? I am going to have you name your child laughter. God calls him on that. What's funny also is that people still disbelieve to this day. This doesn't happen. It says in Matthew 1, All this took place to fulfill what God had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what the Bible says, but people don't believe that. Some even church leaders don't even believe that. I have one example on the screen here. Hey, this is John Shelby Spong. He's retired, but he's an Episcopal bishop. And he says, The virgin birth story reflects a pre-modern understanding of the human birth process. An understanding that because of our expanded knowledge of genetics, biology, and reproduction, educated people today could not possibly believe without closing their minds to vast amounts of data. And he goes on, The early Christians simply did not understand the woman's role in reproduction. The advances in our knowledge of reproduction have obliterated the biological literalness of the miraculous narrative that stands at the front end of the Christian story. He's talking about the virgin birth of Mary. That doesn't happen. We know so much more now than we did back then. So they just had a primitive understanding. Virgin births don't happen. I mean, come on. Well, Abraham and Sarah didn't believe at first either. But their disbelief didn't change the truth of Isaac being born, and neither does disbelief today change the truth of the virgin birth. People disbelieve that today. People disbelieved way back when, even with Abraham and Sarah. And that doesn't change anything. The truth is the truth, whether people believe it or not. And this is kind of... What God says, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? You think this is too hard for me, God says? You you, you think that I can't do that? Are you going to draw a line there? Really? Is anything too hard for the Lord? That's kind of a question for all of us. Do you think that there's anything that's too hard for God? There's parts of the Bible that talk about how God is going to bless us beyond our imagination. You think that's too hard for the Lord to do? Jesus is the male heir that ensures the survival of humanity. So back then, Abraham and Sarah were worried about a male heir because of survival. They had Isaac And Jesus now is the male heir that ensures the survival of all humanity. Matthew 1, 20 and 21. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise is there. Let's look, at the, uh, let's look at the screen here. Who is this mediator? True God and at the same time truly human and truly righteous. Our Lord Jesus Christ who was given us to set us completely free and to make us right with God. And how do you come to know this? The Holy Gospel tells me 
God himself began to reveal the gospel already in paradise. Later, he proclaimed it by the holy patriarchs and prophets and portrayed it by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, he fulfilled it through his own dear son. So there's a continuity in the whole Bible here. Already in paradise, Adam and Eve, now we are at the holy patriarchs. And God is going to continue this promise that everything in the Old Testament points to Christ, who is the salvation. So just some things, some thoughts for us today. God keeps His promises even if it takes a long time. God's promises are not instant. They're not like the instant food that we have, the fast food or whatever, the instant information that we can get with the touch of a finger from Google. God is not an instant God. God makes promises and He does come through on them, even if it takes a while. Abraham, when God first promised to make him into a great nation, he was 75 years old. When he finally had Isaac, he was 100 years old. It took 25 years for God's promise to come through. That's a while. But if you think that's long, it takes even longer for Jesus Christ to come. Jesus is approximately 2,000 years after Abraham. That's a long time. And Jesus said he's going to come again. It's been approximately 2,000 years since Jesus said he was going to come again. Now, he's still going to come again. It's been a long time. People have thought, well, he's going to come in my lifetime. He's going to come in my lifetime. People have thought that since the New Testament. There's evidence in the New Testament But the people who wrote the New Testament, the apostles themselves, thought that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. It takes a while. But it doesn't make God's promises null and void. When God says He's going to do something, He does it. It might take a while, but He does it. So Jesus is coming again. Acts 1.11, this Jesus, this is an angel saying right after Jesus ascended, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That's a promise there. Or Jesus himself. John 14 verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Jesus wants to be with us. I want to be with you. So I'm going to go away for a while, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back so that we can be together. There's a promise there. So it's been a while. The Lord has tarried for a long, long time. But that doesn't make the promises void. He is coming again. We don't know when, but He will. <coughs> So not only does God keep His promises even if it takes a long time, God keeps His promises no matter how unlikely they may seem. So Abraham and Sarah, they laughed at the promise that God made. Really? I'm 100. My wife is 90. This doesn't happen. That's pretty unlikely. Well, Jesus made a couple other promises. This is just a couple from Matthew here. This seems pretty unlikely. Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, you know, you know what meek people are, don't you? They tend to be the ones who are, who are humble and quiet and subdued. People who don't have you know, that type A personality that wants to conquer the world and dominate and be in charge. They're the people who are working behind the scenes, the the type B personality, and and they're just content to be there. Well, everything in our experience tells us that it's the type A personalities, the people who have these 
ambitions for leadership and world domination that rise to the top, that make the big companies, that become presidents and conquerors and such. Those are the people who rule the earth. Not too many meek people make it there. But Jesus says this, the meek are going to inherit the earth. Seems kind of unlikely. I can't think of any examples of that. But nothing is too hard for the Lord. Or just a chapter over. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. It says, Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All right. So, God is, Jesus is saying here, um, I want you to focus on God's kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, I want you to focus on what I'm commanding you to do and to worry about that. Be concerned about that. Now, I don't want you to worry about where your next meal is going to come from or where your clothes are going to come from or the roof over your head or all of those most basic needs here that you have. I don't want you to worry about that stuff. If you just concentrate on doing what I'm telling you to do, everything else is going to take care of itself. It seems a little unlikely. We, we, need, we need jobs to make money to buy the food that we have and the shelter and the heat and all of that. But Jesus says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all of these are going to be taken care of. Seems kind of unlikely. And there's a lot more to say about that, of course, but this is not how we normally think. Abraham and Sarah had to trust God's promises for their future survival. They just had to trust God. So, a question Do you trust God's promises for your future? Abraham and Sarah had to. Do you trust God? And his promises for yours. Just a couple things to throw at you that are God's promises about that are important for our future. John eleven, twenty five through twenty six. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Here's something that we all have to look forward to. We're all going to die someday. It's happened to everybody else who's ever gone before us on this world, and it's going to happen to us too, unless Jesus comes back. But he might be another 2,000 years. We don't know. As far as we're concerned, for all practical purposes, we have to plan on dying someday. That's our future. That's all of our futures. But here's what Jesus says. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you trust that? Some of us go through some difficult times. You know, like, why would God give me such a difficult time right now? Well, listen to this. Hebrews 12, 6 through 7, and then verse 10. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure, God is treating you as sons. He disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. Okay? When you're going through a difficult time, it seems kind of purposeless. You know, why why would God give me difficulties here? It says that God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. Do you trust that? I know some of you out there have gone through some pretty awful stuff. That'd be pretty difficult to trust at sometimes. But this is what it says. Do you trust God's promises for your future? One more. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? 
How many of us are afraid of what other people think or what they might do, what they might pull on us? We have a tendency to be afraid of other people and their power, their influence and such. But it says here, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? God is always with us. I will never leave you or forsake you. Do you trust that? Or are you afraid? The improbability of some of God's promises might lead us to, to scoff or to doubt. And it, and it happens. We have moments of doubt. But, as it happened with Abraham and Sarah, it's going to happen in our lives too. God is always going to have the last laugh. So, the only question is, if God is going to have the last laugh, are you going to be laughing with Him in the joy of His promises? Or are you going to be laughing at how ridiculous those promises seem? Let's rejoice in laughter at the joy of the promises that God makes to us, no matter how unlikely they seem, no matter how long they take to fulfill. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, you are a God who makes promises and you keep your promises and we are so grateful for that. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would put our trust in your promises and Lord, that even if they seem unlikely or even if they're taking a long time, that we would always trust you, no matter what. Because, Lord, you've always kept your promises in the past. And, Lord, we will trust you, no matter how long it takes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.